Okay, picking up at verse 3. He could not make it more bald than to quote Paul. <clears throat> now, you can even figure that out in translation because fortunately the translators um, did that. You know, they translated it the same. But you won't know the significance of the fact that he's quoting Paul, nor will you necessarily know that he's quoting Paul. Okay? Because, <clears throat> you know, in English that sounds like, you know, your typical religious sermon, syrupy language, okay? Maybe all the people when they started their letters or they did sermons, maybe this was a common expression, so it's not necessarily quoting Paul. Okay, well, the doubt about that vanishes for two reasons. Okay, number one, he's using the same meter Paul used. Well, if you don't know that it's metered, you don't know he's doing that. So you miss the significance. The Greek reader would immediately recognize, because that's how they memorize stuff, by first lines. I mean, even today, when I went to memorize Isaiah 53, and I, and I start to forget it. All I have to do is think of the first couple of words and the rest of the sentence or the rest of the passage comes to my mind. That's how they memorized it in the old days. They would memorize the first few words or the first few lines. And so when it's quoted, all you have to do is quote the first part of it. This, uh, um, Luke is famous for writing this way. Luke will just give you snippets of you know, quotes when he's quoting Matthew, for example. He just gives you part of it. And therefore, the reader reading Luke knows where in Matthew Luke is tracking to. I showed that in my synoptics playlist. I haven't finished that playlist yet. It'll take me till I die to finish it. Okay, so every Greek reader, because he's quoting verbatim what Paul said in Ephesians 1.3, every Greek reader is going to be alerted to two things. A, he's quoting Paul in Ephesians. B, he must be metering what he's going to say next. And of course he is. And in case you were a little slow on the uptake, he's using the same meter count. Okay, but that's not all. Okay? He's talking on the same topic as Paul is in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. On purpose. Okay? Who according to his great mercy, okay, rebirthed you. Okay? The second birth. Born again. But rebirth fits better here. Okay? Because, you know, I'm trying to keep the cadence. Who according to his great mercy rebirthed you. And then that's sort of a subclause. That's why it divides there. And then into and then el piso, el pida, this is a pregnant word in Greek literature, famously used by Plato in the Philebus. Okay, into a confident expectation is how my pastor said it ought to be translated, and given how it's used in the Philebus, yes. It's always about future confidence. That's why it's translated hope, but in English, hope is just wimpy. Okay, into the confident expectation the confident living expectation, okay, because of dia, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from among the dead ones. I'm, I'm using literal here. From among the dead ones. Remember, because he went down, and Peter's going to talk about this later in his letter. He went down to Hades and preached, hi, the gospel's real, I won, believe now. You know, because, see, you can get saved even when you're in hell, but they don't want to. They want to shake their fist instead. He went down there to Hades and preached to the dead ones. Peter's going to cover that later in his letter, so he's setting it up now. Okay? Confident living hopes. He's contrasting your living future expectation after death. It's cute, huh? Because Christ resurrected, so will you be. Duh. Okay, so all those people saying you can lose your salvation, don't know how to read Bible. Into, you were born again into the confident living expectation because of 
the resurrection of Jesus Christ out from the dead ones. So because he was resurrected, so will you be. It's as bald as it can be. Okay, and now that's 56. Well, that's what Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 is talking about. Okay? But he's wording it differently because they already know what Ephesians says. And so he's wrapping his text around Paul. It, it doesn't get more obvious than this. Quoting him, using the same meter, and talking in the same way. See, because pa Paul was stressing the benefit we get from Christ. <clears throat> okay? But Paul didn't actually mention, you know, born again. Okay, living hope. Well, yeah, that's referenced in Paul. But he didn't actually spend a lot of time on the resurrection being the juridical cause. See, he dies on the cross, he pays. But the resurrection is God saying, yes, your payment is enough. Come home. All right, that's the importance of mentioning resurrection here. It's Christ's victory being stressed. Okay, whereas when Paul was talking about the mercy, okay, in his passage, he's stressing about the blessing in heavenly places because Paul likes to keep playing upon eulogetas. He uses a eulogesa, eulogia, and all that other stuff. Okay, so Peter's rapping to Paul and adding in points, therefore establishing his own letter as a Bible book, around what Paul wrote in Ephesians 1, 3 to 14. Okay, now the next implication of that, of course, is going to be that our boy Peter has got more meter coming. And I, I, I won't be able to look at that for several weeks. I'm in the middle of my busy season. These things always hit me during my busy season when I don't have time. Okay? I was eating food when I was hit with the fact that Peter was metered. I didn't know this until I went to look at it. I was told the same thing for Isaiah. I was told the same thing. That's how I discovered the meter in the first place. The same thing for Psalm 90, Daniel 9, and the Magnificat and Ephesians. Each in a sort of different context, but during each time I was eating something. Or it seems like I was eating something, or I had my mind on something else. And then the thought hits me. Okay? If you want to see a simpler version, but yet very sophisticated, of how this meter works, look at the Magnificat Meter playlist. Okay, that's the basic name of the playlist in my channel page. You should find it in the time section. Okay, how God orchestrates time. Um, I'm just, I've just reorganized my playlists. And take a look at how Mary does her meter. Because this, this was only a 23-page document. It's a lot shorter than Ephesians, which is 150 pages and very involved. And see how she's doing it. She's tagging past time to her words in the meter. And you can vet and verify all this past time on Google. That's why I listed it. So you can tell what she's tracking to. And she ends with a 56 also. Okay, this ends up being our 53 AD, but she's using a 56. Paul plays off it, and obviously Peter is too. Okay, so he's playing to Mary also, as well as Paul, because Paul builds Ephesians around the Magnificat. Okay, and obviously Peter is also because he's using Diasporas here and Plethune here. Plethune. Okay, Plethune. I can't say that right here. All right, so that's for your homework in case you're interested in doing the meter since I won't be able to attend to this for several weeks. Now, there's one last thing I got to cover and then I'll be done. 84 plus 56 is 140. 140 is 2 times 70. 140 was the number of years that had to elapse from the time the temple went down until the time it was completed in 516. I mean, not 516, um, until Jerusalem Jerusalem was, um, com you know, rebuilt under Nehemiah. And it was really only the walls that were rebuilt. There was no decree of a king to rebuild Jerusalem except God is king in Daniel 9.24. 
But 140 years is really important because that was the, the budget, the time budget. And Psalm 90 talks to it, Isaiah 53 talks to it, Daniel 9 talks to it, the Magnificat talks to it right here. She's, she's actually balancing time based on that 140 years being used. It's kind of hard to tell just looking at this page. You have to go through the math. And she does, baby. Boy, she was smart. Um, so Peter is playing to that 140 years here, too. See, because pre-church, the rapture was, ex not the rapture, the second, the tribulation was expected to begin um, uh, in, of, I'm sorry, um, 90, what was it, 80, 84, 80, roughly, it's somewhere between, somewhere around 84 AD, okay, um, by our terms, that might equate to like 87. Paul plays with different variations of it. What they were expecting it to happen was that Christ would have lived until 37 AD, which was the thousandth anniversary of David's death, because the temple, from the time it went down to the time Jerusalem was rebuilt, there was 140 years um, spread versus the 126 allotted years that Isaiah, is, Isaiah was showing in his meter in Isaiah 53. So there was a 14 year overlap. That was okay because Abraham had matured 54 years early. So that left the, 50, the 40 years remainder that the temple would be standing, okay? And that's what Peter's talking to here. He's doing a balancing, just like all the other metered passages did. He's balancing, so he's saying, well, okay, the temple might go down in 70 AD, okay, because that's 40 years after Christ died, because Christ was scheduled to die in 37 AD, but he dies seven years early. That's why we got the 14-year overlap also, to make up for the, the extra time being used. I don't know if I'm making sense to you. I know this so well, it might not make sense when I'm talking about it. The bottom line is that Peter is balancing to the 140 year period between the demise of the first temple and the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Um, just like you know Moses and Isaiah and Daniel and Mary and Paul had done. So he's following that convention. Therefore, I know for sure, since this is about the temple, his letter's about the temple, he's going to talk about living stones, he's going to talk back to Psalm 90, he's going to talk back to you being the priesthood now, because he's talking back to Ephesians 2, the new covenant, the new priesthood, and because Hebrews is playing on Peter, all that is too much to be coincidence, okay? So, somewhere, I have got to find what this 84 means. I'm sure it's true. I just don't understand why. I know he's using Moses. I know he's using Psalm 90, but I don't know 84 minus 66 is what? Because this is a date line for his letter. Okay? Period. But I don't know what he's referencing. What I do know is that this is deliberate. And I've just tried in brief to explain to you why I know it's deliberate. And if you got any questions, and I'm sure you'll have many, this is a very complicated topic, you know, just ask me. So signing off.